Hey, how's it going? Over the years, one of the most frequently asked questions that I get on this channel and even before this channel is why I use FL Studio as my primary music software and why I have used it for geez, over 15 years now. And I think that the most important answer to that question is because I like it and because it does what I need it to do. People on the internet get comedically territorial about the music software that they use or the music software that other people use. And that's frankly not something that I'm willing to argue about. In fact, I made a little graphic here, and I know you probably think that that's a Japanese flag, but it's actually a pie chart. All I care about is if you're making good music. And if I know you, I guess I care if you're feeling fulfilled by it. That's the whole point. That's why we do this, right? I made this video on brand loyalty for circumstances like this, so I could reference something when I know that winter is coming to my comments section, because I would much rather laugh about how our brains are so poorly designed to deal with other people using different music software than argue about other people using different music software. All right, enough crab assery. Maybe you're a new musician looking for your first professional music software suite. Maybe you are an Ableton or Logic user looking for a fresh perspective so you could write something a little bit different or so you could get reinvigorated. Maybe you already use FL Studio as your primary DAW and you're like, hey, this old guy's been using FL Studio for decades. Maybe he could show me some workflow hacks. And I think that I will be able to do that in this video. So let's dive into a specific and, in my opinion, well thought out list of the primary reasons why I just can't quit FL Studio. The first and foremost win for me, and in my opinion, the most important part of a digital audio workstation for anybody who's writing original music, is the piano roll. And anybody who has spent a decent amount of time using FL Studio's piano roll will probably long for it in any other software that they use. I could go over an exhaustive list of features, and I'm about to, but overall, the reason it's so good is quality of life. And quality of life in software means minimized pain points and increased efficiency in the workflow. And it doesn't come as a surprise to me that FL Studio has this because FL Studio has been around for a really, really long time. So right off the bat, press P for draw, B for brush, E for select, N for drawing in drum mode, C for cut. Holding down control and the middle mouse wheel zooms. Holding down alt and the middle mouse wheel adjusts volume on the fly. Alt plus U chops. You can also use this to lay out one note and chop it into, I don't know, 16th or 64th if you're into glitchy stuff, like this. You can select different chopping templates. You can even make your own chop templates, like this Fibonacci bouncing ball type of thing. If you have a note that is too long or too short, don't bother changing the grid snapping, just double click it and edit. Select whole sequences and drag them out to retime them. Write a melody, drag it out to triplets. Quantize it. Randomize the velocity or panning or whatever. Quantize it to things that are based on other real performances or swings. If you're using a sample or FL Studio synth, you have the power of slide. Draw in the precise piano roll notes for pitch sliding. Make tape stops, weird vibrato, expressive oddities. It works with chords too. Did you record some drums or do you have a drum loop? You can drag and drop the waveform into the piano roll so you can align your timing with the imperfections or swing. Need ideas? Then LFO your velocities or whatever you want. Invert your composition. If that sounds too weird, then limit the notes to certain modes or scales. You can view ghost channels on other piano rolls in the same pattern. Change the time signature in the same channel and pattern as much as you want. Strum, scale levels, arpeggiator, riff machine, it never ends. And also, there's automation. 
which you can do right below your notes, or you could do it in a separate looping or evolving pattern. The options are endless. You can draw it into a snapped or quantized field, or right-click and glide, or draw unsnapped, or make an LFO with a different start and end point, or you could sequence stuff inside that, or you could even make a high-resolution envelope that is an analysis of an audio waveform that you load in there. This is barely the tip of the iceberg, and it can control virtually anything and everything in the DAW, which brings me to... If you haven't figured it out using your eyeballs, I'm pretty into modular synthesis. I'm also into Pure Data and Reactor and any node-based setup. And the reason for this is because the ability to create, build, or modify the system that I'm working in is a huge inspiration to me. Fortunately, Bitwig has the grid, Ableton has Max for Live, and FL Studio has the framework of the DAW itself. Of course, it doesn't look as heady as a node-based system, but the automation and control can go literally as deep as writing your own code or mathematical formulas and using them in your projects or saving them as your own templates. The point is, with only a few tiny exceptions that you're likely to not even find, everything can connect to anything. Example, let's make a simple beat and then use the peak controller on the kick channel to control the pitch of the bass synth. Not only can we edit the peak controller here, but we can customize the connection. If we're using one peak controller for multiple things, we can easily invert one of those connections or we could turn it into a binary signal. It accepts trig functions. I suppose you could make fractals with your signal routing. It can be mapped to an effect. Let's map it to the echo time of the snare. It can even be mapped to the project tempo. Now this isn't even mentioning Patcher, which is a node-based editor that you could load into your session. But it's not only experimental or a way to be creative with sound design. It works wonders for engineering. For example, I rarely use compressors or limiters. I just build them in my mixing chain. So let's break down what compression is at its core. We have an amplifier under something, and then we put a ceiling on how loud it can get, and then we put an amplifier on top of that. That's basically it. I suppose an even easier way of describing it is that it makes quiet things louder. So that way you can prioritize certain sounds. But it is quite of a mixed bag of trial and error. Your kick drum might not be spiking with the same frequencies as the bass anymore. However, now your hi-hats might sound a little bit too loud. Or maybe you could just have it do all the leveling work with audio. When your voice gets really quiet, it'll be the same volume as when it's really loud. But now there'll be a whole bunch of room tone. So we have things like multiband compression, sidechain compression, parallel compression to try and get a little bit more control over this. Or when anything can connect to everything, you can just build the mechanics of a compressor or limiter using volume knobs and peak controllers. All right, an easy and common example. The kick drum and the bass sequence share the same low end frequencies too much. So it peaks a little bit. Now, if we take a peak controller and invert it, we can duck the bass guitar only when the kick is heard. It sounds identical, but the mix can now be turned up louder without peaking. It could also exaggerate it for a pumping side chaining effect. We can also make it bassier now without as many consequences. By the way, I don't usually map these to the actual faders. I use Fruity Balance for this so I could still have control over my main levels in one place and not have to stare at a dancing mixing console, but I'll use the mixer sliders for this video. All right, so even with this drum kit, I want the snare to be more pronounced. Rather than EQing the heck out of it or making it too loud, I can make it slightly duck the overhead mic so the cymbals and hi-hats give it a little bit more priority. This is especially helpful if there's reverb on the overheads.
All right, so what if you just have one file that is a drum loop in a single channel? Well, we can send the loop to a new channel and isolate the frequency exclusive to the kick. You can use para EQ or frequency split or whatever you want. Then we can mute the output and route it to the bass. Using the tension and decay, we can adjust it to our liking. We can even use the same EQ technique to put the reverb only on the snare and then duck it under the kick so it sounds more organic. The application and control of this is unlimited, by the way. You could apply this to every and any sound that you feel is jumping out of your mix too much. If you incorporate it into your workflow, your tracks mix themselves. Now, personally, a lot of times in my music, I'm recording a bunch of acoustic instruments and then mixing them with modular and with VSTs and things like that. And it can get pretty complicated and even abstract at times. But for a genre like EDM, if you build your workflow around this, you can even have a template, and that would save you a lot of time. For some reason, when we think of a good DAW to master music in, we think of the mixing bus linear workflow style of something like Pro Tools or Cubase. But in my opinion, this is way more powerful. I've always felt like FL Studio was the most complete DAW, meaning that you could just install it and get on to making music without needing any third-party VST plugins. Of course, that's not saying that there aren't higher quality synths and effects in third-party VSTs, but this was about as close as you could get. With version 21, it brings it a whole step closer because my previous bare bones setup would have been FL Studio and a good reverb plugin, but now we have Luxfer which is quite good in my opinion. I would say that it's easily the best stock reverb plugin that comes with a DAW. By the way, when making comparisons like this, I'm usually only talking about the top shelf bundles or premium suites. And in FL Studio's case, this would be the all plugins edition, which costs $500, but from time to time, it does get heavily discounted. If you're just looking at all of the prices of the major digital audio workstations, this is a pretty competitive price, but the big deal is, and what most people watching this already know, is that FL Studio has free updates for life. No upgrade fees, no maintenance licenses, no subscriptions. You buy it once and that's it. Somebody who bought this 10 years ago will upgrade to version 21 for the same price as somebody who bought it a few weeks ago. Zero dollars. For a long time, I've been an FL Studio Power user. You could find me on their website. And I assume that a lot of people think that that means that I am a paid shill. At the time of recording, I've not been paid a dime by ImageLine or FL Studio, believe it or not. I'm telling you this because there's actually an important and meaningful reason behind me being an FL Studio Power user. In 2006, like a decade before I had this YouTube channel, I was making a living solely as a musician, and the folks at ImageLine were the only company, software or hardware, that was listening to my ideas and complaints. And I can actually find some features buried in FL Studio today that I could trace back to email exchanges back then. The higher-ups in the company and the developers are actually the people who are communicating with the people in the community forums. And you can feel it. Most DAWs feel like somebody had a whole bunch of ideas and now you have to learn them, whereas FL Studio feels like it's been refined user feedback for decades. And that, in my opinion, is their recipe for success and probably why it's the most installed music software of all time. A lot is new in FL Studio 21, but what makes me particularly excited about this new version is that a lot of the things that annoyed me in previous versions have been resolved. For example, adding an envelope to something in the playlist window used to be annoying. I often had to organize things into automation channels and sample channels. Now it's all in one place. And what's better is that here in the playlist window, there's kind of a poly and play slice and remix vibe available. And you can then adjust all of the envelopes in one go after slicing, which results in some pretty fun and unique sequences. And since this is done using peak detection, I'm already brainstorming about things like putting a microphone in a tennis court or something and letting the algorithm sort it out. Like I said, Luxverb is a wonderful full algorithmic reverb. It also allows sidechain inputs if you want a long and dreamy reverb without it turning your entire mix into muddy poo. Speaking of reverb, do you remember like two weeks ago when Venus Theory and myself risked our lives going into a wild cave? Maybe you don't because the YouTube algorithm killed it, but we did and we got amazing reverb and we created a reverb pack that is for sale. However, 
we just got news that that reverb pack will be included in FL Studio 21. Well, this is DaVinci Resolve, but in the picture there is FL Studio 21. And yeah, you'll have that reverb too now. There's a new multiband delay plugin, which I admittedly have not spent a ton of time with simply because it's so insane. It has 16 different spectral bands that are changeable by bank. I'm excited to play with it more. On first impression, it feels like something that could easily exist as a $100 standalone VST plugin. There's a new vintage phaser, which sounds great. I think it might be overkill for just expanding the sound of a pad, but for something like an electric piano or even making percussion more interesting, you could do a lot worse. Then there's VFX Sequencer, which is a really powerful arpeggiator and step sequencer and frankly melody maker that works inside Patcher. It, it basically gives you a whole lot of options for making semi-generative sequences with in your MIDI chain with plenty of chord detection and controlled randomization parameters. I feel like Patcher is a whole video in of itself. Edison, SliceX, and Fruity Convolver now use Python for scripting instead of PAX compiler, which is pretty exciting for us less experienced or less patient developers. Then there's the thing that everybody seems the most excited about for some reason, themes. And I don't really care that much about it. I darkened my overall GUI by like 2%. There are some color schemes available and Honestly, if you're making music using this color scheme, then you've lost your fucking mind. It appears that the side browser has had a massive overhaul, and it now allows everything from tagging to sample downloading to improved search functions, which was a bit of a pain point, so I'm glad to see that fixed. Oh, and here's something that is a huge surprise in an incremental software version update. The CPU usage has gone down. It is actually improved on efficiency. Imagine if some other companies did that. <clears throat> I'm not sure if FL Studio 21 or this video will drop first. I am sure that I'm too old to be saying drop, so let's just stick to being released as the term for that. But the demo is fully featured. If you decide to buy it, click that affiliate link below and I will give 100% of my affiliate income to the ACLU. Since I started doing this, I'm getting the occasional message or comment that is angry at me for giving money to the ACLU or not a charity that they want me to give money to. From this point forward, if you have any anger or criticism regarding me donating money to charity, I want you to check out this pie chart. The red color represents the percentage of texts on my phone coming from your mom. Anyway, if you like this video, load up my channel on an iPad or a phone with a touch screen and put some peanut butter gently on top of the subscribe button and then just leave the device in the grass at a dog park. If you want to be part of an elegant, extravagant, affluent community of like-minded musicians with a big old Discord server and monthly songwriting challenges and a bunch of audio assets and coupons on your favorite audio software and hardware products, then you'll want to load up my Patreon page and put some tuna fish on the join button and then leave that device in a uh, cat park. Really though, it's as low as a dollar a month and it helps me churn out new and interesting, ambitious content when the YouTube algorithm's being a meanie. All right, bye.